The SG-1000 may be forgotten, but it's not gone. In this episode of Say Gaiden, we're going to take one last look at Sega's first ever game console, before moving along to Sega's first ever game console that anyone cares about. Well, here we are. When I kicked off my survey of the SG-1000 console at the beginning of 2021, I had a general sense of the system's history and capabilities, but given the fact that nothing for Sega's first home console has ever been released in the US in any meaningful capacity, I necessarily approached this whole thing with an outsider's perspective. It's been an interesting journey, and I've made some mistakes and erroneous assumptions along the way. Thankfully, YouTube commenters are quick to set those details straight, and while I can't fix those videos here, I can certainly get things right when I publish a complete chronology of the SG-1000 library in print, hopefully by the end of this year. I'm putting together this final recap video as a way to organize my thoughts, but also as a sort of replacement for the introductory video I put together at the beginning of the SG-1000 series when I was a mere babe in the woods who knew nothing. Now I have a much deeper understanding of this hardware, its history, and most of all, its software. So let's recap. Sega's SG-1000 console sits in a strange place in history. It is, in terms of hardware design, a made-in-Japan ColecoVision. The two consoles contained very, very similar innards, with only the most minor differences between the two of them. In terms of its actual place in history, though, the SG-1000 represents more of an inverse of the ColecoVision. Coleco's system established a new high-water mark for game console tech when it debuted in 1982, featuring a beefy Z80 processor, solid sprite handling capabilities, and a respectable amount of RAM. ColecoVision offered home gamers the closest thing they'd ever seen to arcade-perfect recreations of popular games like Donkey Kong, Carnival, and Ladybug. Had the US console industry not begun its swift implosion almost immediately after the ColecoVision's debut, you can easily imagine it sticking around for several years and potentially breaking Atari's hammerlock on the industry. Or at least sticking around until the 7800 shipped in 1984, pushing the state of the console art ahead even further. Instead, consumers and Warner executives broke Atari's hammerlock on the industry, as well as Atari itself, with the company being parceled out and sold off for parts, and the 7800 being shelved until its actual tepid launch in 1986. The ColecoVision vanished beneath the waves of a rising tide that sank all ships, and Coleco's bizarre mismanagement of the platform and commitment to turning the console into a costly home computer greatly hastened its failure. On the other hand, the SG-1000 launched a year later into a segment of the industry that was just beginning to blossom into a force to be reckoned with. ColecoVision was killed before it hit its stride in large part by market forces far beyond Coleco's control as the American market shrank by about 90% over the course of two years. Whereas the SG-1000 appeared at the outset of Japan's console market exploding. There was nowhere for Sega to go but up, and they did. By many accounts, Sega had shipped the SG-1000 almost on a whim, an attempt to expand its business with no real expectations attached. When the console fared quite well at retail, the company didn't exactly shift its focus away from the arcades that were its lifeline, quite the contrary in fact, but it did recalibrate its home gaming efforts to capitalize on that success. However, Sega faced its own challenge, one entirely different from Coleco's complications. Namely, unlike the ColecoVision, the SG-1000 wasn't the most impressive console in its market. On day one of the SG-1000's life, July 15th, 1983, Nintendo shipped its family computer, a massively more powerful system. ColecoVision had been shipped with a damn good version of Donkey Kong, but the family computer, or Famicom, was specifically designed to play an almost arcade-perfect rendition of that same game. Sega, the up-and-coming powerhouse, was left in the awkward position of selling its own home console that didn't offer the best arcade ports on the market. That claim belonged to Nintendo, whose console hosted stunning versions of arcade hits like Galaga, Star Force, and Xerian, games that also appeared in far less convincing form on SG-1000. Okay, but you know all this. What we've seen over the past year is precisely what the SG-1000 could and couldn't do, and in the process we've seen programmers stretch the hardware well beyond the limits of what it seems like it should have been able to accomplish. In short, the SG-1000 was Sega's attempt to test the waters of a new market. When the company liked what it saw, it built on that hardware for a decade to create bigger, better, and more powerful home gaming experiences. The SG-1000 stumbled frequently, especially where Sega's arcade ports were concerned. 
Consider the way it presented isometric arcade hit Congo Bongo versus Nintendo's handling of the extremely similar Donkey Kong. The SG-1000 rendition of that game is by far the worst port to be found on any contemporary console. You can count the number of satisfying arcade to SG-1000 conversions on one hand. Monaco GP, Sega Galaga, Zaxxon, Sindbad Mystery, and Flicky. Everything else ranges from merely okay to outright terrible. Worse still, Sega's own console somehow failed to offer up conversions of major Sega arcade hits that showed up on ColecoVision. Where was the Turbo, the Carnival, the Frogger, the Star Trek? For that matter, Zoom 909 and Zaxxon were arguably less convincing on Sega's in-house platform than on Coleco's external system. Especially in the system's early days, the SG-1000 gave off a real stench of half-heartedness. It wouldn't be until the advent of the MyCard format in July 1985, exactly two years after the console's initial debut, that Sega really seemed to knuckle down and get serious about making great SG-1000 games. But by that point, its successor Mark III was already waiting in the wings to be shipped a few months later. Then again, Mark III wasn't so much a successor as a new model, retaining the SG-1000's core processor while leaning heavily on an impressive, powerful graphics chip. In fact, the base Mark III hardware had greater software compatibility with the SG-1000 library than any model of the SG-1000 did. The Mark III, as well as its international counterpart, the Master System, contained slots for both cartridges and my cards. The SG-1000 and its revised model, 1984's SG-1002, required players buy a special pass-through adapter in order to play MyCard titles on their system. While this would seem like a ringing endorsement for the Mark III as a sort of ultimate SG-1000, capable of playing new and old games in all formats, in practice that's not quite the case. The two systems used different display technology, and the Mark III, despite its Famicom-crushing graphical capabilities, couldn't accurately reproduce the SG-1000's mere 15-color palette. As a result, all but a handful of SG-1000 games looked awful on Mark III, with eye-searing colors. The pleasant pastels of the SG-1000 became garish primaries on Mark III, a fact you can see in early Seigaiden videos, which were captured from Analog Mega SG without the Mark III color palette feature enabled, an error on my own part that cast these games in a worse light than they deserved. The odd cross-compatibility issues at play in the transition to MyCard and to Mark III speak to Sega's cunning strategy of making it up as they went along. But that strategy was on full display from the beginning with Sega's licensing program. Unlike Nintendo, who embraced third-party publishers within a year of Famicom's launch, Sega insisted on making use of the publishing model preferred by American companies. That is, every official release that appeared on SG-1000 was published as a first-party title under the Sega imprint. I have little doubt that Sega's direct control over the platform made Nintendo's console more appealing to external developers, at least until Nintendo eventually decided to tighten its own grip. But in the first few years of the two consoles competing neck and neck, Nintendo's more liberal structure and willingness to let other companies take a publisher's cut of sales appears to have caused development partners to gravitate quickly toward Famicom. Consider Namco, who developed and shipped Galaga for SG-1000 in November of 1983 a full year before making their Famicom debut. Although Sega Galaga was a pretty convincing adaptation and spoke to Namco's skill at coaxing performance from the console, it would be Namco's only production for SG-1000. A year later, Galaxian hit Famicom and Namco, or rather Namcot, would instantly become a critical force in the Nintendo arsenal. Quite a few other developers tested the waters with SG-1000 before jumping to Nintendo's camp. Jalico, Konami, Irim, Tekon, it's impossible to say these studios shifted their allegiance due to Sega's publishing policies, the appeal of working on more capable hardware, or the fact that Famicom's larger install base represented a guarantee of bigger profits. Most likely, it was a combination of all the above. But whatever the case, Sega seemed to have trouble retaining third-party partners on their console. Yet there was one huge exception to Sega's rule of first-party control, their hardware licensing scheme. Perhaps inspired by the Open MSX standard, which ASCII and Microsoft had launched around the same time as the SG-1000 and Famicom's own debuts, Sega devised a system whereby other manufacturers could produce their own adaptations of the SG-1000 hardware. Exactly one company bought into this, Sakuda Original, a traditional games company that owned the rights to the Othello version of Reversi and had spent several years devising handheld adaptations of that board game. Sakuda evidently saw an opportunity in the SG-1000 licensing system to take its Othello devices into the television space and came up with the Othello Multivision, the only licensed clone of Sega's original console. The Multivision shipped with an adaptation of Othello built into the hardware, which was specifically designed to play that game. The front of the console featured 16 buttons, 
to allow players to designate moves directly rather than using on-screen cursor controls. While Multivision and SG-1000 software offered cross-compatibility, every single one of the clone console's eight releases shipped under the Sakuda original name, not Sega's. Granted, none of them besides Qbert were actually any good, but the Multivision does at least make for an interesting historic sidebar. And a giant pain in the ass for collectors, given the scarcity of the system's library. The spiritual similarities between the SG-1000 and MSX hardware licensing system probably weren't a coincidence. After all, the two platforms were nearly as alike as the SG-1000 and ColecoVision, the primary difference being that the original MSX spec was essentially identical to the SG-1000's hardware design, save for the addition of more RAM, and of course, a computer keyboard interface and support for floppy disks. Ah, but those were actually part of the SG-1000's design too. Sega made up a computer variant of the SG-1000 as they went along, called the SC-3000. Unlike the ponderous and bulky Coleco Atom, the SC-3000 was nothing more than an SG-1000 with a keyboard. Literally, as you could buy a separate keyboard for the console and simply plug it in in order to transform the system into a PC. The SC-3000 line also included a variety of peripherals, ranging from a data cassette recorder to a printer. The SC-3000 never found much traction in the Japanese market, but it fared reasonably well in Australia and New Zealand, where it and the console line were distributed by a company called John Sands. The SG-1000 saw international distribution, primarily in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, but also in some parts of Asia, for about a year, after which point Sega appears to have stopped exporting their games overseas. Still, the moderate success of the SC-3000 inspired Sega to continue supporting the peripherals and promoting their continued support well into the Mark III era. The identical nature of Sega's 8-bit console and 8-bit PC hardware, which even used the same cartridges, meant that the SC-3000 offered no exclusive games, only education and productivity software. Some games offered additional features when played on SC-3000, such as Loadrunner, whose level editor mode required the presence of a keyboard. But by and large, the SC-3000 is more of a footnote in SG-1000 history than a platform in and of itself. A footnote of a footnote, in other words. But experimental and aimless as it all may seem in hindsight, nothing about Sega's handling of the SG-1000 and attendant offshoots was especially unusual in the mid-80s. Both Coleco and Nintendo offered expansions to transform their consoles into computers too. They also released no end of peripherals in addition to their computer variants. Coleco had its expansion modules, and Nintendo eventually shipped the disk system for Famicom. If Sega's approach to the platform seems fairly scattered shot, that's because it was. But so was everyone else's approach. The rules of video game consoles and home electronics in general hadn't been written in the 1980s. The entire medium would remain highly fluid up until the advent of 3D hardware, and consoles like PlayStation and Dreamcast more or less nailed down the rules that were still operating under 25 years later. And we wouldn't have gotten there without Sega, or without the SG-1000. For nearly 20 years, the company helped define what home gaming should be and how it should work. It didn't always get things right, and even the mighty Dreamcast couldn't turn around some of the fatal miscalculations the companies made in the mid-1990s. But the legacy that began here helped make all of that happen in the first place. It doesn't hurt that there's some pretty interesting software on the system, too. One thing I'll be doing in my SG-1000 print retrospective is putting games in their proper release order. Sega, as I've mentioned many times, didn't keep any internal records of precise game release dates for pre-Mark III material, but that info can be found in contemporary publications like Game Machine, an arcade-focused trade pub that occasionally posted roundups of console games and their release dates, including those of Famicom, SG-1000, and Epoch's Cassette Vision. Lacking that information when I launched Segaiden, I just went in order of software catalog numbers, which it turns out was wildly mistaken. For instance, according to Game Machine, the games available at launch were not the first three compile-programmed arcade ports Borderline, Safari, Hunting, and InSub. Bizarrely, Borderline doesn't appear to have hit retail until the following spring. Instead, the console launched with InSub, yes, but also Mahjong, Serizawa, Hachidan no Sumi Shogi, Kongo Bongo, Yamato, and Starjacker. In fact, this seems like a great opportunity to recap the SG-1000 library and very briefly review what we've seen over the past year, but this time in its proper order. We begin in July 1983, which gave us the console, the SC-3000 computer, and six games. InSub was a post-Space Invaders vertical shooter that added another axis of movement and shooting. A decent game, albeit much less challenging than Sega's usual. 
Mahjong was a pretty big deal. A home Mahjong title, playable on a reasonably priced device? That was a big selling point in early 80s Japan. This release doesn't look as nice as Nintendo's Mahjong for Famicom, which shipped a month later, but it plays more or less the same. Which is to say, one-on-one -on -one versus the CPU only. Sarizawa Hachidan no Sumi Shogi was not a full Shogi game. That would have demanded processing resources well beyond the SG-1000's humble processor. Instead, this was a teaching game built around solving specific scenarios. Congo Bongo for SG-1000 is an absolutely dreadful conversion of the arcade Donkey Kong killer, missing not only two of its four levels, but also flattening its iconic, isometric visuals into a semi-side-scrolling perspective with terrible controls. Another naval shooter, Yamato somewhat successfully adapted an arcade game in which players controlled the doomed Imperial warship of the title, gunning down enemies with both small rounds and large war cannons. A curious vertical shoot-em-up, Starjacker gave players multiple lives in the form of multiple ships, controlled all at once, leaving extra chances highly vulnerable to enemy attack. It wasn't a perfect game, but it was fast-paced enough that you didn't notice the SG-1000's lack of hardware-based scrolling. A month after the console's debut, Compile and Sega shipped this adaptation of the arcade May shooter tranquilizer gun, called Safari Hunting. With its methodical pacing, it stands out for more manic games in the same genre, like Stern's Berserk. Champion Tennis is a port of an MSX tennis game that introduced the SG-1000's champion branding for sports titles. It played reasonably well, but it also introduced the champion line's great weakness. Just about every one of these games would be greatly overshadowed by a Famicom equivalent within a matter of months. And arguably, no champion game had it quite as rough as Champion Baseball, a conversion of an Alpha Denshi arcade hit whose tiny visuals and auto-playing fielders feel terribly feeble compared to Nintendo's Baseball for Famicom, which shipped a mere two months after this October 1983 release. A fast-paced and compact take on Sega's lengthy arcade pinball legacy, Sega Flipper's speed can't compensate for cramped design and the fact that the ball doesn't actually operate with real physics. Also in October 1983, Tsukuda Original released the Multivision, with this built-in version of Othello, designed around the buttons on the front of the console. It's Othello. Konami appears to have developed this adaptation of Gottlieb's Qbert for Multivision, and it shows, it's the only multivision game that isn't known to cause weeping and gnashing of teeth. The stripped down port of Tekon's maze game Guzzler is tolerable, but its awful sound design will have you scrambling for the mute button. Moving on to November of 1983, Sega published three arcade games, or near enough. The first, a port of Jalico's Pop Flamer, is unfortunately an absolute mess. Packar, on the other hand, reworks Sega's head-on with more variety and finesse, making it perhaps the first truly notable, semi-original work for the console. Namco's Famicom version of Galaga would deliver near-perfect arcade greatness. But that would be more than a year after this perfectly solid adaptation arrived on SG-1000. Sega's final arcade creation before their move to microprocessor-based hardware, Monaco GP turned out pretty well on SG-1000, all things considered. A legacy of classic racing games begins here. Less classic is this time-based racer by Orca, which is, as the title says, essentially a slalom in which a space shuttle has to weave between sets of stars. It feels unfinished, which is probably why it's the second rarest game for the console. And the rarest game for SG-1000, Pachinko, closed out 1983 in a deeply disappointing style. <laughs> 
a single pachinko table with gameplay that consists of nudging a stream of tiny balls into pins is rumored to have been recalled due to defects. But maybe it was recalled just because it's really bad and pointless. Thankfully, SG-1000 began the new year with a palate cleanser of sorts in the form of Sindbad Mystery, a great conversion of an interesting hybrid of Pac-Man Heiankyo Alien and Crystal Castles. Designated as catalog number G1001, Borderline is a somewhat primitive shooter that offers more variety than is initially apparent. The vertical scrolling gives way to levels more akin to Dig Duck and Reactor. Another case of unfortunate timing for the Champion line, the clunky Champion Golf debuted a matter of weeks before Nintendo created the defining work of the genre with Golf for Famicom. This conversion of IRIM's cross-country motorcycle arcade racer would appear on Famicom a year and a half later, but at the time of its SG-1000 debut, it was the first proper forward-scrolling racer to have appeared on a Japanese console, which makes it notable, if not great. Another in a long line of space invaders alike, Exarian sold itself in arcades on the strength of its dazzling horizon scrolling effect, something that comes off absolutely horribly on this hardware and makes for a game that's really hard to love. Released just four months after Pachinko, the sequel, Pachinko 2, includes the original game's single table plus two more arrangements with whizzy dynamic effects. It's still not fun, but at least you wouldn't be paying $2,000 for a nearly non-interactive experience if you want to collect this one, unlike the original. SG-1000's first media license game, Belgo 13 is a carnival-esque shooting gallery based on the long-running Gekiga manga about a cold-blooded assassin. In this case, he's ruthlessly protecting innocents from an out-of-control passenger train by shooting out the windows so they can escape. Based on an anime cast from the Robotech Macross mold, Orgus features a transforming jet slash robot whose mode shift is more of a liability than a feature. May 1984 brought us Space Mountain for Multivision, an absolutely terrible rendition of Atari's Star Wars arcade game with the serial numbers carefully filed off, along with any sense of fun. Somewhat impressively, Sakuda Original one-upped Sega's Mahjong with their Sanin Mahjong cartridge, which gives players two AI opponents instead of one. It's still 8-bit Mahjong, though, so... Eh. Challenge Derby was the first ever horse betting simulation for consoles, which makes it a non-existent blip in history in the West, yet somewhat remarkable in Japan, where pretending to wager on imaginary horse races over which you have no influence has long been a gaming mainstay. Arriving just two months after Nintendo's Golf, Ayako Okamoto's Match Play Golf was an interpretation of the sport considerably more convincing than Champion Golf, plus it featured the endorsement of a top women's golf star. Safari Race gave players a sort of proto-outrun in which players basically did an impression of the Paris Dakar Rally. It was memorable for its beautifully detailed player auto sprite and the fact that you have to stop on a dime to refuel at a gas pump every minute or so. Around this time, Sega released the second model of the SG-1000, which contained the same innards but traded away the older model's awful hardware joysticks in favor of detachable Famicom-style pad, and whose sleek design fell in line with the era's beautiful Japanese industrial design trends. Far more faithful to the PC original than the Famicom adaptation Hudson had shipped two months earlier, Loadrunner for SG-1000 lacked Hudson's cartoonish charisma, but it contained nearly twice as many levels. A curious menu-driven boxing game, Champion Boxing is mainly notable for its bold visuals and for seemingly being the first project by future luminaries like Rieko Kodama and Yu Suzuki. 
arguably the most convincing of the Champion Sports line. Champion Soccer doesn't look quite as nice as Soccer for Famicom, which would debut a few months later, but it plays reasonably well on its own merits. Developer compiles first original work for the platform. Hustle Chumi is a platform maze action game about a mouse who needs to evade enemies while collecting food. Said food has the unfortunate side effect of weighing him down. The Multivision's dire take on Zevius, Space Armor moves in an agonizing crawl and features a horrible background music loop that resets every time the player triggers a sound effect. This final release from Sakuta Original adapts Milton Bradley's hit game from Atari 2600 with tolerable competence. With Home Mahjong, Sega solved the problem of how to let two people play a game that involves keeping your tiles hidden from the other player. They included an acetate screen partition to block the opposite players of your hand, thus enabling one of the few multiplayer console Mahjong sims of the era. Finally, Sega seems to have found sure footing as it closed out 1984 with an absolutely top-flight adaptation of arcade hit Flicky, which plays and looks great on the hardware. You can see that second wind in action as Sega kicked off a strong 1985 lineup with one of the best love exclusive works ever made for the system, Yuji Naka's Girl's Garden, a game about gathering flowers and dodging ravenous bears. Playing as a sort of combination of Zaxxon and Super Zaxxon, the SG-1000 port of this isometric arcade classic plays well despite a few visual deficiencies compared to the ColecoVision game most notably where the eponymous homicidal robot is concerned. Seemingly based around the Champion Boxing Engine, Champion Pro Wrestling is a clumsy and an elegant rendition of the sport, to say the least. GP World offered a proper F1 racing simulation, complete with a track editor. It's not amazing, but you can definitely see Sega's racing ambitions firming up. The first of two Konami games for the SG-1000 proper, this adaptation of the game better known as Mikey would be great if the controls weren't so sticky and uncooperative. The other Konami release, Hypersports, is a part of the track and field family. Unfortunately, it's the family member that no one wants to invite to holiday gatherings. A respectable if difficult adaptation of the Tekon arcade shooter. Star Force for SG-1000 lacks the special magic that Hudson infused into their Famicom port, unfortunately, not to mention the massive promotional push that version had received. On the other hand, the SG-1000's version of Space Invaders is considerably more convincing, not to mention enjoyable, than the lackluster Famicom rendition. An excellent port of the game even if it lacks all the zany extra modes of the 2600 port. In July 1985, two years after the console's debut, Sega shifted away from cartridges to the compact MyCard format. This has been presented as an aesthetic choice, those bulky black carts were pretty ugly. But also, it no doubt had a financial factor. Lacking plastic shells and big chunky boxes, my card games were cheaper to manufacture, cost less to transport thanks to their greatly reduced weight, and required less warehouse space to store. Plus, in a society driven by compact convenience, my cards won a points for being even smaller than Famicom cartridges. A bid to bottle the lightning of Irem's Kung Fu Master, Dragon Wan doesn't quite pull it off, despite allowing players to move somewhat freely around the enemy dojo. Zoom 909 deserves points for trying, 
but this rendition of Sega's dazzling VCO object shooter just can't pull off the arcade game scaling effects on such humble hardware. The addition of a new, horrible top-down stage just makes things worse. This adaptation of Bruderbund's Apple II hostage rescue shooter Choplifter is more respectable, though perhaps it's the single most brutally difficult version of the game ever made, especially compared to Sega's more nuanced arcade adaptation, which debuted around the same time. This is a curious take on Pitfall 2, which in terms of design falls somewhere between the Atari 2600 original and Sega's more linear arcade adaptation. A high watermark for the console, action puzzler Doki Doki Penguin Land is essentially one long escort mission as you guide a fragile egg to its destination at the bottom of an iceberg. Nuance controls and physics put this one in a class of its own. A rare post-card catcher cartridge release, this version of Othello is distinct from, but largely identical to, the multivision version. The main difference is that you don't need to use the multivision's front panel button pad to play it. A great adaptation of Taito's single screen puzzle action game Check and Pop, this hues much closer to the original release than the prettier but more frustrating Famicom adaptation. An Old West themed shooter without a light gun, Bank Panic demands you move tactically to collect bank deposits from 12 different vault doors while gunning down criminals. The only real weakness of this version is that the SG-1000's meager palette makes it tough to distinguish criminals and citizens by color, as was intended. A port of an obscure Apple II platformer that helped inspire Sega classics like Flicky, Droll isn't amazing, but it's an interesting little bit of history. Unfortunately, around the same time that this one shipped, Sega launched the Mark III console, which included the similar but far more exciting flicky spiritual successor Teddy Boy Blues on day one. A disappointingly dire port of the arcade hit, largely undermined by the console's lack of smooth hardware scrolling. The pace and mechanics of elevator action unfortunately happened to fall into a sort of dead zone, where the hardware's quirks hurt the gameplay. Rock and Bolt is another esoteric conversion, this one of an Activision puzzler built around a construction theme. It's surprisingly fun and holds up well even now, making it a real highlight of the SG-1000. I'm pretty sure that there was a law requiring this box-pushing puzzler to show up on every console that debuted in Japan in the 1980s. So with this release, Sega avoided hard jail time. Though touted as a sequel, this was actually just a port of Hang On, but with simpler visuals and choppier scrolling. Compared to the Mark III version that had shipped two months earlier, it's pretty painful, although it's easily the most technically accomplished racer on SG-1000. On the plus side, it shipped alongside a really cool motorcycle handle controller that would continue to be supported on Mark III and Master System. an expert's only collection of 50 additional Loadrunner stages. Championship Loadrunner hates you and wants you to feel stupid. So, so stupid. The final SG-1000 Activision collaboration, the MyCard version of Hero adapts a popular Atari 2600 classic in fine form. Despite its simple looks and design, or really because of them, the frantic, hyperkinetic hockey sim Champion Ice Hockey is by far the best of the champion sports line. It's pure, dumb, multiplayer fun. 
an admirable attempt to translate the arcade hit to SG-1000, Bomb Jack is badly undermined by the system's palette limitations, which turn the backgrounds into a busy eyesore and make individual active objects difficult to distinguish. We begin 1986 with CISO, another compile creation, single screen platformer with a slightly overcomplicated design revolving around seesaws. Ninja Princess offered a really solid adaptation of an arcade shooter set in feudal Japan that trips up only as a result of the console's scrolling limitations. The solution Sega settled upon, scrolling in half screen increments, is clever but it turns the entire game into a test of memorization. Champion Kendo is an absolutely bizarre fighting game in which your fighters automatically swat at each other with wooden swords and you try to earn points by doing Kendo-y things. Another arcade port with generally similar mechanics to Ninja Princess the awkward tank controls and tiresome infinite enemy spawns of Super Tank prevent it from being nearly as fun. Compile's final original creation for SG-1000, Golkov is a horizontal shooter that feels a lot like the sideways version of Xanik. It throws around a ridiculous number of enemies and objects and features a tricky power-up system that demands you learn its ins and outs so you know when to dodge an icon to prevent a power down. What a brave, ambitious effort. Wonder Boy is really not a lot of fun on SG-1000 with its choppy scrolling, floaty controls, and truncated design that shrinks the adventure from 32 stages down to a mere five. But God, you have to hand it to them. They honestly tried. Despite the champion name, this is straight up a port of Compile's Lunar Ball, aka Lunar Pool and therefore it's great. A game so enormous it couldn't fit on a MyCard. The castle brings ASCII's 100 screen maze platformer from MSX to SG-1000, and it's kind of amazing. This would later be reworked for the NES's Castle Quest, but this is the more impressive effort just for how impossible it should be. Equally impressive is Loretta no Shozo, Sherlock Holmes, a proper murder mystery graphical adventure so beefy, Sega Stealth branded it as a Mark III release. It's unfriendly in all the ways games like this tended to be, but it's remarkable all the same. And finally, Sega adapted Bulletproof's iconic PC role-playing dungeon crawler, the Black Onyx, to SG-1000. It's also unfriendly in all the ways RPGs of this vintage tended to be, but it makes for a strong segue into the Mark III's crowning achievement later in the year, Fantasy Star. And that's it, all 75 games for SG-1000 and Othello Multivision, released between July 1983 and March 1987. So which are worth tracking down today? Well, for my money, the most impressive games from a technical perspective are Golkov, Hang On 2, The Castle, and Champion Boxing, plus Wonder Boy. These aren't necessarily games you would want to play, but they definitely need to be seen just to appreciate how hard Sega's developers worked to exceed the console's limitations. And the most impressive in terms of playability by modern standards? I'm going to go with Flicky, The Castle, Champion Ice Hockey, Rock and Bolt, Zaxxon, and Doki Doki Penguin Land. In terms of games to avoid, well, there's quite a few. Particularly dire are Space Slalom, both Pachinkos, Champion Kendo, Elevator Action, Hypersports, and pretty much everything on Othello Multivision except Qbert and maybe Match Play Golf. I think anyone with a serious interest in video games owes it to themselves to check out the best of the SG-1000 if nothing else. There's a lot of history in this system, and it's honestly fascinating to see how Sega's internal dev teams went from fumbling newcomers to confident technical wizards here. Without SG-1000, we'd never have had Master System, which means there never would have been a Genesis, or a Saturn, or a Dreamcast. You don't have to love SG-1000, but you have to respect it, 
And finally, special thanks to all my Patreon supporters for making it possible for me to track down and document these games, and for frequently spotting my caption typos before my videos go live. Thanks all of you for making this happen. And that's it, the SG-1000. When Sega Gaiden returns in a few months, we're going to look at the transitional period between the SG-1000 and the International Master System, the early days of the Japanese Mark III. As they say in Japan, please look forward to it.